like the eternal city that is Rome. Hello, I hope everyone's having a good Saturday afternoon. Today, I'll be speaking with Jared Selim. He is a guy who reached out wanting to share his conversion story. So it's a very interesting conversion story. We'll hear all about it from Mormonism to Catholicism. But Jared, welcome to the show. How are you doing? I'm doing very well, Mike. You. Thank you. It's great to be here. Uh, this is a this is my first time sharing in, in my story publicly since my a conversion and my baptism back the at Easter. So what is be what is what would it be street trying out some new things and and, and exploring the journey together. So mm -hmm. as far as a personal background, so i I've been a long lifelong member of the, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, colloquially known as the LDS faith or Mormonism. Uh, there's been some recent uh, uh, movement to try and, and solidify the a different name than Mormon because people don't want to be recognized because Mormons tend to want to be recognized as at least nominally Christian because uh, because they want to be a little bit more in integrated with other faith communities. I'll just use LDS where I can. Um, I've been so I mean I've been LDS for my entire life, and I grew up in what is often called the what's was called the mothership of. Mormonism. It's Utah, Salt Lake City area. Um, my family is uh, again my on my parent on my on my mom's side. She's was a pine. She she has pioneer ancestry. Uh, mm -hmm. Her her ancestors uh, met a contemporary of Joseph Smith in Indiana, which is the state where I'm currently from, and they were introduced to us ideas. Later moved to Nauvoo, Illinois, which was in the past, the hub of Mormonism, and before they before they all moved west after Joseph died and Brigham Young came to Utah, which is where my ancestors on my mom's side came in. So, as far as as far as my is is my my other interests go, I've been trying to do a systematic study of Mormonism, uh, trying to take things in from an insider's perspective. Uh, I think a lot of there's a lot of there, there's a lot of apologetic work that relies on not fully cementing yourself in the worldview, not knowing what appeals to people who are yeah. within a system and are used to uh, thinking about things a certain way, have different priorities about what is important to their faith. I want to try and make pe let people know that I hear them and and want and. And helping people open their eyes a little bit more. What's what? What are the what are the things that would matter to a Mormon and and, and help them and hopefully to move a bridge to what I believe, believe is a true faith, the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. And so I'm the I'm the primary author of my own personal blog, windsofeden.wordpress.com. I have currently have six uh, apologetics themed articles on there now and th those th 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 those will slowly move out more and more as i have time for it uh, mm -hmm. th that's so that's generally my background my so my 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 my, my original faith more mormonism i'll give everyone a brief overview of that that is so yeah. 19th century uh america New England, upstate New York. Uh, there is this uh, man named Joseph Smith who, and he he's he he's moved around quite a bit in his his life. He used to live in Vermont. His family's just settling in this new area, which is a very which is a hotbed for religious the, for religious dialogue. It's a uh, upstate New York was often called the burnt over district because there were so many religious movements at that time that were. So let's, let's say oh, evangelizing to the to the most vigorous extent that they could uh people converting all over the place you know the first great awakening this is the second great awakening but these two movements were characterized by um a, a desire a desire for american renewal uh you know george whitefield yeah. there was there was always this or 
some other people, I think it was Jonathan Edwards was another Protestant pre preacher at the time. People were known for having these, uh, when they converted or had this spiritual born again experience that a lot of people are familiar with nowadays and whether you're Protestant or LDS, you have this emotional sense of well-being that uh, was this, was almost this confirmate this internal confirmation to them that they were saved. Um, that was kind of the atmosphere that Joseph Smith, there was a religious atmosphere that he grew up in. And right around the time when he is 20, he reports that he had this religious episode, this, this religious experience where he claims he saw two personages, God the Father on one hand, physical body, and on the other side, Jesus Christ. So, um, and, and, and then of course, there's a lot of uh, restorationist movements going around at this time, slightly different from Protestantism. It, it just it just is this intense desire for renewal and and, tr and trying to build up the uh, and try to build up the church and uh, and its primitive in whatever primitive state people in America would have perceived the New Testament church to be in at the time. Mm -hmm. Um. This vision that Joseph Smith details in about 1830, 1830, 1832, he, when he writes this down, he um, all the, all these he claims that the all the creeds and, ch and churches are false. Um, in strong language, uh, all the creeds are an abomination to me is what uh, Joseph Smith history is this, the most official report of that vision that we have available. And so he, and so from that point on, he he starts uh, reporting and, and building this narrative of all, of all these other revelations that then should become what it, Mormonism knows it as today. Uh, there's the Book of Mormon, uh, as it, uh, where Joseph Smith claims to have revelation to have received the instructions to find these golden plates that were writ that were that were supposedly written in ancient sort of like a new book of the bible adding on another book of the bible similar uh the the way that modern mormons again I, i'm trying to present it in the, the way the nor their, their narrative that most modern mormons would understand it today yeah for sure it would be understood as another testament of jesus christ so mo the way a Latter Day Saints think about Scripture is it's a uh, the, the the way it supplements your religious life is different than the way most traditional Christians would understand the Bible. It's a uh, the, they don't consider the, the Bible an infallible text. Um, they I, I, and and the way and, and given the history of the way the Book of Mormon's been treated over the last two centuries. Uh, you, they don't have these like these. They, they, there is there is a scholarship where it does give some of this detailed scriptural analysis, but it's not. But you're but you're not writing on every writing on every single syllable that's written down. It's just they don't. We, we they, I didn't think that way at the time, and I I think a lot. I think I think a lot of other people they saw they saw it as this, this great devotional experience and this witness to them that. God was being present in America through this book and later revelations that Joseph Smith reported later on in his life. Um, that and then from and then from that point, he, Joseph Smith he moves down to Nauvoo. That's where my family comes in, and he moves on to. And then after he dies, he's murdered. Uh, Brigham Young takes up the slack. So there's a little bit of, of factionalism that develops right around that time. Most, but most people overall moved to Utah. And from here, the Brigham Young's attitude, I'll just get into a little bit of what life as a Mormon looks like and what the authority structure looks like. So Mormonism, it's not exactly like how Catholics perceive uh, the Episcopate or the priesthood. It's a, the, it's, their sense of authority is very centralized. Um, Brigham Young cons had this, this belief that it was, you know it's, it's somewhat similar to how Catholics, in, in a very rough parallel, that he was the 
infallible leader of the church. And yeah, the interpreter, you see, would you say the interpreter? I, 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 I mean, the, I mean that that's the only, that I, I use that word to give parallel to how Catholics would perceive the Pope, but mm -hmm. Catholics do not perceive uh, the Pope as this generally infallible prophet. Uh, this this person that that that's this person that's authorized to receive binding revel new revelations. Um, we we don't we don't understand the Pope more of as a guardian, um, defining the faith in times of crisis and in times where that re where that where the, where the faith is called into question in such a way that people need to reorient themselves toward tradition that's been passed down from the apostles mm -hmm. through what we'd call the magisterium, which is just a lat, which is a Latin phrase for the te the teaching body. Um, but Brigham Young, again, very centralized, and but his authority, his sense of authority is very well defined. Um, there's this idea, um, there is this idea of subsidiary, this idea that there's a hierarchy that trickles down. You got the president of the church, the prophet, which would have been Brigham Young. And then you have a, you do have somewhat of a conciliar body, which is the quorum of the 12 apostles. And then it goes down from there until you reach a level of a, a bishop, which would be the equip, the Catholic equivalent of a pastor priest. Mm -hmm. And then, and then, and then from there on, uh, it's a lay priesthood. Everyone's, every man is expected at some point to be a participant in the order of the priesthood at some point in their life i grew up and when i was when i was going through 12 when i was 12 years old and 14 and 16 i was ordained a deacon as a as a rite of passage and yeah. then and then then when i was 16 i was i would be ordained a priest and although the, the extent of what those offices could do wouldn't be anything like they what you'd expect it in to see in a catholic church there was there's a there's a very tight notion of what each office you would see as a teenager would be. Now, so given this sense of, of, of hierarchy, there's a, and the interesting thing, it's getting more into my personal back, my personal background. Mm -hmm. So I live in the Northern Utah area. This is Salt Lake, Sandy, Provo. I, I spent a lot of my, young childhood in an area called uh, saratoga springs alpine lehigh it's a this, this is a very fast growing part of uh, the wasatch front area and that's in, in most of my the time there was you know just i mean just spent just, just spent with my parents my my parents homeschooled me for and my sibling my two siblings for an extensive period of time and the the environment utah is a primarily mormon community um yeah you're, like 80 percent or something like that i don't remember the exact statistic but it's quite dramatic um, very very high yeah it's it, 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 it would be like saying i mean i mean you you live in the south in the south is that correct yes kentucky, you're, kentucky. You're, so I, I would I, I would I don't know how you'd expect this. Protestants um, down there are more widespread than in mm -hmm. other areas of the of the, U, of the United States. Is that right? Yeah, like Baptist. Uh, there's actually a big Catholic population just uh, around right. Louisville, the Kentucky Holy Land, of course. But um, yeah, Baptists and Pentecostals especially. But mm -hmm. those two really come to mind. And with, with that. Would it would it be would it be so concentrated as to say you'd expect your neighbor to also share a generally the same the if if you were a Baptist or a Pentecostal at that time would everybody share the religious worldview is would, would it be so much you can knock on someone's door and say hi we're friends we go to the same church uh, some more community it's that kind of thing yeah I think like back in the day it was like nowadays it's kind of like a, a religious indifferentism that goes around mm -hmm. people who don't mm -hmm. affiliate with churches but like back in the day of course there were the germans and the irish in the city in louisville they had their communities it's so like just myself i think i'm pretty much 
uh, one of those descendants from the Snellen, from the German side. Mm -hmm. And so there's still tons of German parishes, distinct German parishes. In a, in a Catholic area, in a, in a Catholic area down there. Okay. Yeah, especially in the Catholic sense, because the Archdiocese um, of Bargetown, there used to be a Diocese of Bargetown, like way back in the day. So just uh, in my area, familiar area, uh, yes, Catholic, so... Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So, 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 so you did this, it's got this in a sense. So my family in Lehigh, Saratoga Springs, they, we, everybody would have gone to the same church. Um, my, my, my house was just across the street from the meeting house. So, and so, and, and generally everybody could walk. It, it, it was a very, it was a very localized community and, and morally speaking, it was uh, very conservative um, in terms of what your in terms of what expectations were about life. Not not necessarily conservative in a in in a, in a European sense. It was a very, it was a very Americanized post World War II sense of community. Everybody dresses well uh, in suits, uh, shoes, shirt, shirts skirts for for skirts and well and, and well-groomed dresses for women um you it, it, it in the uh, that framework for mm -hmm. a mormon would be it, it, it would it, it certainly wouldn't be low church it's a it, it's somewhere in the it, it's somewhere in between a a, a non-liturgical high church setting that keeps things quiet and, and and maintains a sense of reverence and silence and well in, in good grooming without without being overwhelmed by the kind of the the Pentecostal extravagant or or charismatic extravagance you know uh, or, or or just if ev ev evangel or evangelical um yeah, see, the emotionalism the, 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 all of the, that experiences right. seeking the experience mm -hmm. there is okay so there is so there is some of that and we'll, that we'll get into later but i just want to make the point mormonism is not a place where you have water slide baptisms hmm. <laughs> very good very good yeah um so my family on my on my mom's side and my dad's side uh we uh when, when we when we first moved to lehigh i was young and my my family had had recently been through quite a bit of personal turmoil at that time. Um, I had I when I was three months old, I was diagnosed with a stage four neuroblastoma. So my 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 I would live in, I had a very medically demanding infancy, and then um, my sit my brother and sister very shortly after I recovered uh, fully from my cancer. My brother had an experience with um, he he had a cognitive regression, lost all of his speech, was diagnosed with severe autism. My sister had some of that it, it as well, but fully recovered. Um, but we we became a from that from that point on, my parents need uh, needed to think about things a little bit more differently from what a from what a physically healthy family would be like. Um, there was a need for insurance uh, that my parents uh, needed to be creative with managing. My dad had an entrepreneurial business that didn't have insurance at the time, but my mom was working in a in a executive business setting. And so, when the time came that the three my my siblings and I needed a lot more personal attention. We chose to keep the, my mom and, and dad chose to keep the job that had the insurance, which was my mom, mom's job. Mm -hmm. And then my dad set aside his entrepreneurial business to essentially be the maternal figure at home, be the one that, and that was there when we got that way there when we got home from school, um, cared for us while my mom was at work. And because that environment was so centralized and formal and in the uh my my parents did not fit well all into that environment so i wouldn't say we were ostracized but we were marginalized in a way yeah. that 
I do distinctly remember. Um, from that, generally from that point on, my experience in Mormonism was was never having deep familiar familial roots in a single location. Um, there, we, uh, my, my, of course, my mom, who is also Catholic, by the way, she convert, she was baptized Catholic with me just this last Easter, mm -hmm. um, which I'm very grateful for. This would have been a totally different experience had that not happened. The, is the rest of your family also considering becoming Catholic, like your sisters or brothers? So I have one sister, one brother. My, um, I'll, 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 I'll leave that to them. Um, there's a mixture on my sister's side. Um, uh, this uh, more agnostic. Um, not, not consider, not, not consider, not considering a traditional faith right now. And then my brother, he's so autistic. He, um, if I were to describe his personality, it would be like a 12, 13 year old inside a 23 year old's body. Um, which, 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 which made, which made life kind of interesting because I'm the youngest in the, among the three of us, but I, yeah. I take, I take the social role of my, of my, el my brother, who's the oldest. So there's this inversion in the sibling roles and there's this inversion of my mom and dad, which was just prudent at the time. Mm -hmm. And I, 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 uh, he was different my i i would i would, I would say it did it, it it did it did it did teach me some respect for their maintaining peace being margin being in the margin and respecting those that are that have some necessary differences in their life i i don't i don't i don't feel like a victim and it um because of what it had experienced what because of the different some of the difficult experiences my mom and dad had with religious leaders, bishops, stake presidents, and the like, who were less than pastoral toward them at the time. I think I, I think we developed a sense in that time of learning to grow where we are planted, to endure with grace. We didn't suffer, but we 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 learned we we learned, we learned to take it. In a, in a in a way that we that we would, that we try to use to edify the community and hopefully grow or, ourselves because of that. So, those early experiences, that setting in my ch in my childhood in this Mormon community in Lehigh. The uh, I was a difficult kid growing up. Um, when I uh, you know you you moved through Sunday school, um, I I was I was the kind of kid that would get into fights. I was kind of, I was kind of temperamental. I did not like being there. I did not, I did, I did not, I did not like to eat, sitting still, all these kinds of things. And generally speaking toward, um, my, my family's religion, I, I, I had a vague sense of God as Mormons would understand him, but I did not care for sin or mm -hmm. the, or the need to be a, you know, of a, a morally upright person, and so I and so I, I there were many times I means going up all the way until I was fourteen years old, where I acted more selfishly, more indulgent, more flippant, or or on many other occasions just bitter. I did, I was not a I I was not antisocial, but I was not a pleasant man to be a pleasant kid to be around. Mm -hmm. So w during this time, um, my parents, they're both devoutly, they were both devoutly LDS at the time and took space to cultivate our faith. One thing that we'll notice that a lot of Latter-day Saints who might be watching, what they would, there, there, there's a little twist on our upbringing that would be different. So when let me bring it into this very traditional scene in a modern LDS community. So every first Sunday of a month, you are invited to give an ab lib testimony or prof or profession of the things you value most or are convicted of the most in the LDS church. And so a lot of times parents would bring their little kids up to the pulpit 
and whisper into their ear these these very common platitudes that you'd hear over and over again during testimony meeting. Uh, I know Joseph Smith was a prophet. I know the church is true. Uh, God loves us. The, the um, And a lot of times that would carry through into someone's teenage and age and adult life. But there, uh, there was this written track that a lot of people did and that echoed into their children's ears as if, there was no sincerity behind the child's own words, words yet because they weren't at an age of reason. Yeah, and not to interrupt you there, but you said like Joseph Smith was a prophet. Like you heard that echoed. So did you like personally ever um, consider that like uh, not in a factually sense only, but like just um, did you ever consider like what that meant? Joseph Smith was a prophet. Yes, later on. And this is kind of, and it, and it this is where my mom's approach to faith was different. So because my brother was autistic um, and, 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 and because of the family situation and her own convictions about that she had developed earlier in her life about what faith should be, she wanted that to be possess something that we possess for ourselves. She did everything that she, that she should have, that she did most everything that she should have in order to cultivate a spiritual life in the home. And my dad helped with that it, as the primary care, caretaker of my three siblings. My brother, we waited. Um, Latter Day Saints believe in credo baptism. It's this idea that you you you're, bap, you're you're baptized when you're at the age of reason and can discern the faith and can articulate it. It's basic tenets. Uh, un, unlike Catholicism, uh, Lutheranism, or meth or method or Methodism, and some of these other branches of Protestantism. Uh, the, uh, so my mom, because she didn't like the notion of baptism being a right, a so-called rite of passage. And she also didn't like it for priesthood ordination. She, she wanted us to be, to have some, some sincere initiative behind her faith. And so we waited two years for my brother to be baptized until he was 10 years old. We invited the missionaries over to our house and my mom had these children's books because my, my brother was, is a, he would have been 10 years old at this time. And his, his understanding of the faith had to be kept as very simple level, but it had to be presented in as very, it had to be presented with as, as much sincerity as, as we could possibly give. It wasn't just going to be you perform in this social setting like you're supposed to, and then you eventually gain that as a result of being in this social atmosphere. It was where it is a very deliberate effort to be converted in the intellect, you'd say. And that could carry, and um, that's, that's a, I owe a lot of, of that it, it to my mom. I think there's a lot of good things that can be learned from taking that approach to faith. Although I, I do, I would not necessarily agree with the whole, with, with credo baptism as a theology now. But the intent behind it was good. She went, she, uh, Catholics call the teaching of the faith catechesis. And my mom had a good sense for that. And generally speaking, so I go through this early period of my life. Um, my, my, uh, my family trying to cultivate these experiences. There's two things that are going on up until I'm 14 and you just, it's not, not, not necessarily behaving well. Um, my family, my mom had gone to Israel several times. She had once gone for this um, this event that uh, Glenn Beck. He's a popular LDS conservative host. A lot of uh, a lot of other faith 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 people from other faiths listen to his his work. I actually didn't know he was LDS. I, I knew him like as a conservative pundit, but never as a Mormon or whatnot. Right. And he just, I, th I think there's, there, I think there's, there's something really interesting about that. I, I, I have, I have my, I do have some qualms with the way that he's presented his own faith in that. I think, um, but for during this time, there was, there, there was some, in, there was some interest. We had some interest in these, in culture, cultural revival kind of events that he was doing, like restoring honor at Washington, D.C., restoring courage in Israel, which my mom went to, and then restoring love in Dallas. We, My mom was very attracted to 
this pursuit of this pursuit of personal virtue and restoring some connection to uh, the the revolu the the America of the American Revolution. Um, looking back to people like George Washington and others, which Glenn Beck was doing a lot, used to do a lot more of now. He used to, he was almost an inspirational speaker at that time, more than a conservative pundit. And that's what attracted my mom. And so she took this opportunity to go as an, uh, as a Latter-day Saint on this pilgrimage to Israel, found that deeply moving, got into some contact with some lifelong friends on her bus, Red Bus A, and a lot of those people were Protestant, and a lot of them were Catholic, and it just felt this whole different network from what we are often used to as Latter-day Saints, because you tend to live in Utah in this isolated environment where you don't have a lot, because there aren't a lot of local those from other religious traditions, you don't get a sense of how other people live, how they choose to worship, and among other things. So my mom, this, this, this is a bit of a, this, this is a bit of a, these events were some, and of course my mom has did his own, did his own things. I'm really articulating these things from my perspective. We gain a lot of new friends from other faith traditions here, including Catholics. And one of the people that um, we met, we had different connections. This guy was not, this man was not on Red Bassé, but he knew who we were. He had some personal connections to Glenn Beck himself, had written part of a book with him. Um, his name was Joshua Charles. And this guy, he's this young Protestant fellow. He's fit, about 15 years older than I was at the time. So this had been 10 years ago. So he would have been in his mid-20s. And his he got in some, into some contact with my mom. They became Facebook friends. And... We, later on, as the years go by, um, after this Israel event, I, uh, we see Josh go through the, he, this, he, this man's a very intense studier. He, mm. uh, he looks at, he, 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 he did a very a in-depth analysis and study of the founding fathers of America, wrote a book and kind of translating the Federalist Papers and other and, and some other key documents from the Ameri Times of the American Revolution and the birth of the United States into modern language to make that more readable. He was so thorough in his study and he didn't do things halfway, spent a lot of time reading books. I, I remember one time, we're, we're, we're friends, we're good friends now. He loved knowledge, loved reading books. But me at this time, when Josh is starting to get in, he, he's getting himself involved into different projects, the Museum of the Bible, and they let him on this, they let him with a, with, with this income, and he used to work for the Museum of the Bible, and his, he, they let him essentially research anything he wanted to make, and we'll make a new exhibit out of it. And yeah. Josh, we see him do this and he says i want to read the church fathers i'll find i'll probably find some things interesting in there and then during this time he just starts posting quotes without any comment and my mom starts seeing these this is a decade ago it's a it's a it's a it's a it's so it's it's, it's a diff, it's a very different time period from what we are right now and what later came to be so this guy see all these things, things have a very distinct notion of authority, and this guy slowly is becoming um, less convinced of Protestantism, and it starts moving towards Catholicism. Um, and, it, and, it, and to everybody, it, it, in a sense, so to the surprise and shock of a lot of his Protestant friends, but my mom watching this, she says, wow, a lot of these things that these figures are saying are things I would ex want to hear in church things that I should be hearing in church. Mm -hmm. And so my mom yeah. is, we don't, the we don't, we don't, church fathers are great. I was grabbing that book there. Yep. Yep. 
I got, I, I mean, I, I, I got, I do a lot uh, now, nowadays and I'm Catholic. I research uh, things, a lot of things digitally, but I do have, a, I do have books like Eusebius around. And my mom, the, she gives me this, this is about 2015, 2016, right about when he's starting to have the shift from Protestantism to Catholicism. My mom's not even considering converting at that point, but she tells me this kid that really doesn't care for religion or for going into things deeply. He's this kind of flippant kid. He says, if there's anyone I want you to be like, I want you to be like this, this guy, Josh. And I kind of just, I, uh, I listened to it. I, I, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't throw it back at her with any negativity, but I just kind of listened to it. Okay, whatever. Uh, is okay. Like Josh reads books all day. I'm not interested in that. It, so I'm just going to let this, it, I'm just, I'm just going to let that slip and what, and just go on and do, keep doing my own thing. The other thing that happens, my mom wanted to take us back to Israel. And I have this, I have this experience in Israel. It's a whole family together. This is my mom's third time. We go to uh, the the, ch the Church of All Nations. It's a, or the Basilica of the Agony. It's set on the Mount of Olives. It's a traditional site where Christ would have bled from every pore, um, sweating while praying to the Father three times. Um, Latter-day Saints have this different devotional connection to that place and we start walking around this little complex around these trees that some of them which are alive and old enough to have been around when christ was praying on that mountain mm -hmm. and for some reason this kid that's been at least basically catechized due to my mom's goodwill and efforts I have these thoughts that come upon me that overwhelm me with emotion and with the words that keep coming. I would have done this for you, even if it was just you. And that is this, I, I didn't, because the, fun, the funny thing is right at this time, this is what I would, a lot of people consider this a born again experience where they turn their lives around. I didn't exactly turn my life, life around, but that invited me into a desire to move toward a sense of Christ as my Lord and Savior. Yeah, like but a discovery. I didn't, I, I discover, it's a discovery of Christ. It's a, it's a, for some reason, it's it's this conviction of his love. And I carry that with me, Barry, for, let's see, this is 2016 in May when that, when that happened. And then in 2017, late 2017, I, uh, I'm still, I'm still not uh, uh, behaving well, generally still flippant. And then one night, this is November, 2017, I have a dream that rocks my soul to my core. And, uh, yeah, I tend not to take these, th these things too seriously now, mm -hmm. but the, the content of the dream, if I were to describe it, it would be like seeing Christmas Carol. Ebenezer Scrooge and only being exposed to the final part, the uh, ghost of the Christmas of Christmas is future. It's this dull. This is, this, this is how you were, this is how you're going to make everybody suffer and pay for the act, the course that you're taking. And I had these loud thoughts coming to my mind. It's a dream. It's a very audible thought it comes in front. If it, it, it's like shouting at me at the back of the head while I'm being, being relayed to this image of what I it would have been. And I hear these very distinct words in my mind. It's from the book of Joshua. Uh, Ishua, Choose to stake whom you will serve. And that, that changed me. Mm -hmm. Being exposed to this idea that hell was not a place you'd be thrown in to a lake of fire. It's a place where your conscience burns you. And this idea that you could have been better, but didn't choose to be, that you did that you could have yielded to the call of mercy and didn't choose that, that you were indifferent, you're flippant about it. That was 
that was in some in some ways toward regarding my be, my personal behavior and my outlook in life that dream was more eventful more effective at changing me than that gethsemane experience mm -hmm. and that i mean this for, for latter-day saints it would be I, this is what we'd understand as personal revelation uh this i get this i get it you have this private sense this, this this private connection to who god is and what he wants for your life a lot of latter-day saints would interpret it that way there's some there's there, there is some there is a very strong notion of that in catholicism although it's interpreted differently i'll, I'll get into that later but the way i start changing my behavior i didn't want to be anything like the guy I was before um i the, the guy the kind of ideas that i'm attracted to are the i i'm, I'm attracted i'm attracted to more this exalted sense of virtue of, of the virtues and this this like this idea that man could be more dignified than he is now i've become very much more attracted to these images of george washington that were painted in my mind when i was smaller this um uh, george washington he had these rules of civility i don't remember how many there were but it'd be a lot of these really things that would be more that we'd regard as fashion now it's, it's really kind of stupid it, it, when you're a lot of modernists sit down and don't cross your legs keep your foot feet firmly planted on the floor as a sign of culture and discipline that attracted me a lot afterward because i didn't want because anything that was disciplined was different from who i was and i start doing these other things that um i try to be i try i try i try, I try, I try to be more devoted in my personal life to god i start i uh one, one story that I think is kind of funny. Oh, okay, two actually. Um, I start reading the Bible from that point on. There's just there's this impulse to do things that I didn't want to do before, and it was a good and I, and I thought it was a good impulse. And the time and have, being exposed to the Bible was an important step in my journey. It was this King James version. I have it right here. It's just this old edition that has these notes made by an LDS is apostle named Bruce R. McConkey. You know, this uh, triple combination. You got all you got all the little books in there lined up to read. And the I remember two things that happened with that. I want to read my Bible every day, and to try and better myself as a person. I go to my local bishop or branch president because it was not because we were living in Indiana. We had moved at the time, and I tell that and I tell him I want I want to do better and I, and I want to have someone to mentor me through this process of renewing myself. And he says, "Yeah, that's great. We will talk." And one of the things I want you to do is just read the Book of Mormon every day. There's power in the Book of Mormon. He effectively gives me this kind of testimony. That you'd expect to see in a at one of these fast and testimony meetings on the first every Sunday. It's that kind of thing. And I and I and I and I and I and I obey my spiritual leader and do that. And so I, I'm reading both the Bible and the Book of Mormon side by side. But it was just it's, that's just so it's it's funny to me that my instinct was the Bible at the first time. Mm -hmm. uh, the current edition of the of the Book of Mormon, the physical copy that I have right here. One of the things you'll notice, the binding fell apart. And the King James version of the Bible that I have here has not. <laughs> Which was curious because, it, I mean, this, I, I read it all the time. But the one thing, one thing held its binding together better than the other. And without any intentionality behind my part. And what's Which that? Funny. And uh, my, the other thing, again, I have some other things that are happening. I had developed kind of this own set of rules, like George, like these Georgia Washington rules of civility. Um, I, I had this, uh, back when I was a kid, I had this fierce prejudice against dogs. I was afraid of them. I was unrepentant. I was just, just going to be this immortal anger. 
against these creatures. And then afterward, I wanted to let go of that. And my dad, um, he did, he, my dad, it, uh, when he was uh, seeing all this, he described this episode as a flip. Um, is it when the, it's like lights suddenly turn on. There is this, uh, for him, it was this very unexplained event that my behavior would su suddenly change. He saw me as this happy-go-lucky kid. I cracked jokes all the time. Didn't take life seriously. But for him, it, that was what was familiar. And my dad really does not like change. He's the kind of guy that would be upset by move from one house to another, especially from one state to another. Um, he didn't like being uprooted, didn't like family dynamics changing. But when I had this experience, my dad, who's still LDS, by the way, I uh, all of a sudden I have this one episode of wanting to let go of my old fear. And so I just, I had this one dog, we were at a friend's house one time, and he runs toward me and I do nothing but smile at it. I don't want to get away from it or anything. I'm 14 years old at this time. And my dad sees this, me suddenly being friendly with something that I had hated for my whole life. And he looks at that and says, where is my son? I want him back. And this episode, that's kind of colors a lot of the interactions that I had with my dad afterward. I was becoming, I was, I was slowly drifting away from more, away from being happy-go-lucky to being more contemplative and philosophical. And the change inch was distur was disturbing to my dad for a long time. And you know, I, afterward, I didn't take that change meekly as I should have. I, I I was still. I one of the things you come across in Mormonism. I'll, since we were talking about George Washington before, if you go to the U, the United States Capitol in the rotunda, there's this image of George Washington sitting at the top in the center. Uh, the painting was made in the 19th century. It's called the Apotheosis of Washington. And it's essentially this idea that Washington was exalted like one of the Greek gods uh, on a throne. There is no Christian imagery whatsoever in that painting. Although for me and the people that would generally have been conservative at the time, that was, he was nominally Christian. But this idea that jo George Washington had fitted, it res it, I didn't learn about this painting until much later, until I had, after I was considering becoming Catholic. But that yeah. image of exalting, uh, Joseph Smith once made a remark, those who exalt them, those sons of God who exalt themselves from the God, uh, who exalt themselves into gods, even from the, before the foundation of the world, are the only gods I have reverence for. And this, so uh, uh, just for the viewers there, like, what does he mean by gods? Lowercase gods, of course, but either, what does that mean? Either. Um, uh, when, when it's meant as a proper noun, it's, it's capitalized. This would refer to God the Father otherwise. So I'll, I'll briefly give an idea of what Latter-day Saint cosmology looks like. God the Father is not this transcendent um, figure. This, he's not supernatural. He's, he's occupied and confined and harnessed and in control of these natural laws. Uh, Mormonism, I describe it as naturalism. It's a form of that. And God is described as this person. You know, there, there is still this, this sense of Jesus Christ. He's, he, he is purely man in this sense. But man is construed as this, as to, as this uh, germ of divine humanity. In a way that the the person of God and the per, and the person of man, there, there's no distinction between those. Man is viewed as this uh, quasi divine figure, um, in a sense that you see someone something that's more a little more polytheistic. Yeah, like an um, East, Eastern religion. Uh, since... More, I no, I, I'd say I, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll get into that into during another podcast episode because this is a big topic all on its own. Yeah, but there were explicit comparisons by Latter Day Saint authors to the Grecian myths or to Egypt. Um, there's this uh, there, there's this one verse in 
uh, one of the scriptures that Joseph Smith came up with called the Book of Abraham, it explicitly describes the Egyptian mysteries as imitating the true priesthood uh, passed down from Noah and and going and going back to Adam theoretic, theoretically. But this but this mythology that of Egypt, this connection to the way they perceive the world was very present as a expression of how Latter-day Saints would. Um, it, it is it, it Latter-day Saints have this, uh, have a, the sentiment around that is that when you're immortal and you become your own God, there's this idea that you can continue your family relations in heaven as they construed as they are now, but in a cosmic level. Mm -hmm. And the, and this is the same pattern that God, the father went through and that Jesus Christ at some point in the future, there's this, uh, Brigham Young had this idea that Jesus was married during his, his period, that during, during his, during his the time of the incarnation, his mortal ministry is, as Latter-day Saints would use the term, um, which, which, um, that was a Brigham Young quote. That's not, that's, that's not something that is generally regarded in LDS scripture, but it fits into this paradigm of how Latter-day Saints value the family. Um, but when I look back at George Washington and I, and I saw these different things, I said this, this idea that virtue and personal development, this, this idea of self-actualization, it would have appealed a lot to me at the time as a teenage Mormon. The kind of kids that afterward I had this flip experience would have resonated a lot with that. And um, afterward, so this is... 2017 2018 so the other person in my the other major person in my life my mom it turns out that when you start behaving you can get on a really good terms with your parents <laughs> mm -hmm. and my mom she's a little more philosophically inclined um she she's she wants to she she starts giving me books um just to, just to read. For some reason, I all of a sudden want to become the guy that reads books all day. I wonder, I just wonder how that happened. And the one of the books that she gave me, the reason why this is important because it was real. It, the the intellectual test that this presented to me stretched me in a way that was almost distressing. So during my time as a Mormon, being I would say my personal experience as a Mormon, it's not universal, but I was intellectually sheltered. I was expected to listen to people's theological background that whose ideas advocated for mine, who affirmed mine. Mm -hmm. And my mom, she we go up to Canada once uh, for, for 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 some personal reasons, and she picks up a book, Jordan mm -hmm. Peterson, Twelve Rules for Lo for Life. The Canadian Jordan Peterson. Right, Canadian Jordan Peterson. We were up there in Canada. My mom, she just reads through the first two chapters. Like, okay, she reads through the table of contents, reads the rules, hold your shoulders straight up, uh, tell the truth or at least don't lie. These seem like harmless ideas. And when I get into that, that is a very difficult book to hand a 14-year-old. And... I remember I got all the way up to rule seven before I quit reading. Um, it's interesting how I remember the, when I stopped reading, I had this thought in my head. It says, I don't understand. I didn't have the intellectual maturity or, or, or discernment to process the ideas that Jordan Peterson was dealing with. He was dealing with Nietzsche and Dostoevsky and this branch of philosophy that I could not process at the time. And so I just, this thought that I had was, okay, I can't understand this. I'm going to reject it and keep myself away from those ideas. And I'm going to go to people that know what they're talking about. And which in my mind was people that affirm my faith. I had, I, there was this uh, resounding, this, 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 the distress that that reading that book caused me um, closed me off to seeing a lot of alternative viewpoints, um, or at least, or at least tempting to wrestle with them. So I'm closed off. My dad has kind of the same attitude. 
he had the same similar attitude at the time. Do things that are affirming. Don't present yourself as a don't don't investigate things things that it, things that are distressing to you. Um, I think a lot of people, um, their experience in Mormonism. Uh, my uh, one one example that comes to mind, uh, Jeremy Christiansen. He was a recent convert to Catholicism uh, from the Mormon faith. He wrote a book right here called the uh, From the Susquehanna to the Tiber: A Memoir of Conversion from Mormonism to the Catholic Roman Catholic Church. Great book. Um, if you're if you're a Catholic interested in the conversion story, or if, if you're LDS and we're wanting to try and prove to articulate some of the things that might be attracted to someone like I eventually became during this time. And so Jeremy Christiansen in this book, he he articulates there's this um Neil A. Anderson. Uh he he's he's an LDS apostle still alive, and he writes down this quote. I'll see if I can find it. Uh, it's the... Oh, yes, here it is. Mm -hmm. So, there was a... During, dur during I say, the, t the 2010s era, there was a lot of... The internet suddenly blew up. And there's a lot of information going around online. And Jeremy Christiansen's experience of that as an adult um, was uh, troubling for him. Um, this, uh, lots of high profile excommunications from the LDS church for people that were essentially writing tracts or, or scholarly articles, uh, that were not affirming of the LDS position. And so this guy named, named Elder Anderson, the quote that he gives was, um, to those of faith. So speaking to a Latter-day Saint audience who looking through the colored glasses of the 21st century, by, so personal bias, honestly question, who honestly question events or statements of the prophet Joseph from nearly 200 years ago. May I share some friendly advice? For now, give brother Joseph a break. In a future day, you will have 100 times more information than from all of today's search engines combined. And it will come from our father in heaven. And then he bears its testimony. And this attitude that he takes is this idea, the way, the things that you discern as a result of research are less emphasized or under, or in a fideistic sense, you're set that you're, you're expect, you're expected that when you have these distressing feelings about the things you're observing or reading about, that you set that to the side and you stay with what's uh, composed as this ad, as this, this normal affirming environment, and so th this idea of this intellectually sheltered life persists, and so in a way that was a good thing for me because I become the kind of guy that wanted to maintain a perspective within a paradigm, and uh, there was one guy. His name was Elder Maxwell Neil A. Maxwell. He was the person that married my parents. In the Salt Lake Temple, um, I later became very a, much attracted to his work. Um, in, in, he he embodied and wrote about a lot of the things that would involve the moral reform that I was seeking after 2017. But he makes a statement: "Don't go to Judas when you can ask Jesus Jesus questions," which mm -hmm. that's a rational thing for me to understand. Don't co don't come to people that are uh, adverse to your position. Don't come to people that are insincere, unwilling to take your argument seriously, or have ulterior motives, some reason that would taint their viewpoint of what of the things that are worthy or attracted to your set of beliefs. Don't do don't don't uh don't taint yourself with people that are troublemakers. Um now there are things about that that are interesting. You don't want to have uh, you don't want to have uh, um, unrestrained biases affect the way that you perceive something. You don't want to go to people have these false reports to have this in for Mormon this anti-Mormon perspective that I had this very specific idea of that 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 is that kept me away. You know, even Jordan Peterson, he's not anti-Mormon. He doesn't even mention Latter Day Saints in the in, in the in the chapters of the book that I made it through, but. 
the things that distressed me about him were simply the existence of his alternative viewpoint and his articulation of that. That is distress. Mm -hmm. That was distressing to me as this person that one that had a that had a father and had his community that wanted things kept stable. And so later on, I keep reading. I read. I have this different philosophical journey that sets me on a different course. It's very much related to these things that, you know, it's this, this apo apotheosis of George Washington. I've become very interested in that, that idea from a more intimate perspective. Um, and I carry on with this, this, this private life. So come to 2019, 2020, um, my, my experience in the faith, you know, I'm trying to be devoted and thoughtful and the and the time in, in this time period uh i re I, I start i start to realize is is the or just or discern or just these two kinds of distinctions between the way latter-day saints pres, pre, um, enter the world so you have this idea of personal revelation this interior this interior um experience with god that you're expected to prize subjective, as, even, subjective huh? experience suggestive um you know, uh, Catholic, subjective su subject subjective but deeper than that private um a lot, yeah. the catholics have this um acquaintance with this idea called gnosticism uh it's from a greek word that means gnosis means which means knowledge and that came from this early set this early heretical sect of christians that were convinced that their private knowledge overrided the authority and teaching of the bishops. Um, it wasn't quite that severe in Mormonism because of the sense of authority that Latter-day Saints have, but this idea that there was something private that was independent of the visual world, this observable world, which included rational thought, uh, empirical evidence, this kind of thing. There's this thing that was impenetrable that you contain in your heart and mind that you, that you call personal revelation. There was this, there was this idea. And then on the other side, you have this very strong notion of authority. Um, Latter-day Saints, here's the interesting thing with this Gnostic tendency, you also have this hyper, uh, this hyper, this, this, this hyper, this, this hyper strict, um, concept of what the, the prophet is expected to be infallible on. Mm -hmm. So if you go to Latter-day Saint scriptures, you have um, several things. Doctrine and Covenants, section 1, verse 38. It says, whether it is the voice of my servants or my voice, it is the same. And my word shall not pass away. This is uh, one of Joseph Smith's revelations where he claims to be speaking for God. Um, there are other things that are in, in uh, the Doctrine and Covenants that suggest uh, the the prophet the president of the church specifically cannot you lead you astray if you go to my blog i have a whole article on this where you can review the way that that the canonical structure of infallibility how that work operates within mormonism mm -hmm. so here's the thing uh latter-day saints as far as i'm concerned as, as far as i've been able to discern and in my ongoing studies in mormonism there's not really a pathway to saying that some things a prophet says are infallible and other things are not. This idea of conditional infallibility. Because um, here's the thing. Joseph Smith, one time, he made the statement uh, kind of off the cuff. It's in this obscure journal. Uh, the prophet is only a prophet when he is speaking as such, which is somewhat similar to this idea of conditional fallibility that you'd see articulated in uh, the Council of Vatican I in the 19th century. But here's the thing. Um, Catholics have this very tight notion of the Pope only speaks infallibly when he's speaking ex cathedra from the chair when he's speaking on, 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 on faith or morals. Um, Joseph Smith did not give a articulated rubric for, infall for his infallibility. Um, at all, either in that same or, not, or in others. So what well, you're left with, uh, a lot of the uh, Latter-day Saint theologians at the time, uh, LDS apostles, presidents, 
um, in the 19th century, right after, right when this, when Brigham Young was at the height of his presidency, they were quite insistent on the fact that you obey the prophet. Um, absolutely. Uh, Heber C. Kimball, I quote this in my article. He says, yeah, obey your leaders. It does not matter what they, if what they say is right or wrong. If you dig for water, you'll, if, if you dig with, you sh put your shovel on the ground, you'll, you'll find water in the ground, no matter what they say. Um, this is a very, this is a very strong absolutist viewpoint on infallibility. Brigham Young said, any sermon that I give is as good as scripture. Uh, this is in the Journal of Discourses. You can go to my blog. I'll, I'll, I'll link that in the comment, my, my blog to, in the comment section for people to view later. Um, there's disagreement about um, whether the prophet is infallible within Mormonism. But as far as the canonical st structure is concerned, I have not been able to find a way to escape the idea that the prophet is absolutely infallible. Um, other than just using your private revelation to decide, okay, this thing is infallible and I'm going to, and, and this other thing is not, which is Gnostic. It's a site which goes back to this problem of using your private experience of the faith to judge your superiors in a way that would be insubordinate. So uh, when we get into 2020, March, 2020, uh, the pandemic happens. Mm -hmm. So with Latter-day Saints, um, the, the, the world's in turmoil, but for Latter-day Saints, this, this, uh, these two concepts of personal revelation that you use to uh, privately have this conviction of the truthfulness of the church and its teaching, and then this authoritative hierarchical structure, this public magisterium, these two things, you're, you're uh, in conflict with whether you view your private revelation, your personal revelation, as the main lens through which you interpret the magisterium or the teachings of the prophets and the apostles. Or if you do it the reverse and you subject your personal revelation to the authorities. So when, that, when the pandemic happens... What happens is that a lot of these these individuals that are Latter-day Saint or you're liberal or conservative, the the organization of the LDS Church, the general authorities, they take this pro-establishment view on uh, on uh, disease procedures, uh, preventive measures, that kind of thing. So this would be masks, ja the jab, um, social distancing. The way that they conduct their meetings changed to accommodate this. Um, the Latter Day Saint, uh, the Latter Day Saint individuals who are liberal tended to follow the prophet um, because it, because this is what the establishment thing to do, and and it and it seemed like the compassionate thing to do at the time, given how much confusion there was in the world. On the other hand, you have conservatives who, although there is a strong notion of traditional morality and this need to keep things balanced, for some reason, there's a shift away from the public authority. And all of a sudden, this, this is the strangest thing. Um, there were some conservatives that had a rational reason to the dissent from the authority, whether that there was some problem with the jab or with the masks, um, you know, I, I I was I was conservative at the time. Although I made masks for choirs at the time, I was involved in in a family business that made these masks. Um, but that's because my my medical background, my my mom had already done a lot of research. She could discern through a lot of the confusion that was going through a lot on the time, and didn't esteem. She didn't follow the crowd, and so she could. And so her expectation about how things were supposed to go out, and in our in our family situation was different. And again, this idea of um, that's the site. That's kind of this uh, idea of where being marginalized came in handy a little because it's because it developed some sense of self reliance, a discernment that would have been helpful. Um, but my but my family is observing the situation. 
And we're seeing these conser either these conservative Latter-day Saints or these liberal Latter-day Saints divided over who you're supposed to follow. In an unusual phenomenon among the conservatives, they start appealing to their own private revelation to disobey the guidelines of the church without having this sound canonical reason for doing so. They don't, they, they don't process, they, 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 they didn't take that into consideration when they were doing these things. And so the movement in the Latter-day Saint in culture is this is an intense polarization. And these two things that were supposed to bring unity to the Latter-day Saint community, the hierarchical structure and personal revelation, all of a sudden these things two are set against each other in this reverberating way. And people are angry. Um, people are not listening to each other. There's very little concern for people who fall in between the cracks. Um, my, my, my grandmother, we were, we were back living in Utah at this time. We moved between Indiana and Utah quite a bit for a variety of reasons. Uh, we are witnessing this. We're in the, back in the mothership of Utah. And we're just watching this happen and seeing this profound dissonance. And this uh, lack, this deterioration of the things that made Mormonism as a social network co cohere. Um, this is troubling to me. This 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 is troubling to me. My mom is uh, my mom. Um, she was involved in some latter and some charity work with the LDS Church. Um, did not have a positive experience there. I, I'd say I'd say there were a lot of people that were, again. This, this, uh, in terms of bureaucracy, is this very conservative, uh, rigid lean. Um, they're more concerned about rules than about caring for people for a humanitarian effort, which frustrated with in my mom. So she has her own story about this. Um, that troubled her. Um, we had just moved back in to Utah into a different new community. So my 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 siblings and I are struggling to integrate. There's all these things that made us feel isolated, more, more than marginalized, isolated. And so I'm sitting here, I'm reading books all the time. And my mom is just having this, she, she wasn't having a crisis of faith. She was having a crisis of not perceiving charity among people that in her community, this lack of this lack this lack of this lack of unity among people that were supposed to be brought together by what they believed in, mm -hmm. and again, I, and again, I'm having struggles at the time too because I was wanting to take my faith seriously, and it's this kind of difficult thing. I would have been a priest at the time, so 16 years old, and by and large, the people that were talkative in my Sunday school group, um much like a traditional Protestant setting, a youth group. There was two guys that were having serious conversations about the content in hand. Uh, there was me. Um, and then there was the other guy who was arguing for atheism. So this guy, this, this other teenage guy um, was not convinced of the content, but he was trying to intellectually engage with it. And so was I at the time. And that, that was demoralizing. And the to not to not to not see the, a lot of my peers tr try to have this a vigorous conversation about these things that I that I that I was so convicted in at the time. And so when I get to that point um, of reading, I just I just seriously wonder what's going on around uh, on me, and why 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 is it that people seem to be reducing um faith either to this political tool or to this desire to seek comfort and not really be well catechized or not to be not to be con not to be contemplating the doctrine of the church and so i'm just like what the on earth is here's do i call this and i don't have any answers mm -hmm. and so my mom she's the kind of woman that sends me lots of books um you know she was first it was Jordan Peterson, and then later on she sends me C.S. Lewis, um, and then 
and then these, all this, essentially this body of work that I become acquainted with during this time period, I'm just a little surprised that I, I start, I'm, I'm all of a sudden because of my mom's, um, is uh, my mom's uh, desire to see me grow intellectually. Yeah, her support. She, um, she, support. Her she, she, she did some reading on her own too, because we uh -huh. were temp because we were temperamentally similar, but she starts introducing me to C.S. Lewis. And all of a sudden, I have this realization that there's this intellectual seriousness that dwells outside Mormonism. The, the, the glass has suddenly broken. I can suddenly hear what's on the other side of the wall. Uh, and C.S. Lewis, he, uh, in Mere Christianity, he articulates this model of the Trinity, that um, this idea that you can have, in analogy, you can have multiple sides of a cube participate in the unity of a single being as a cube. And for a two-dimensional creature that couldn't perceive this unity or understand it or comprehend it, there was still, though we might see those things as, se as either separate or be confused as to what his real meaning is, seeing things not as a two-dimensional object, but as a three-dimensional object that would have been beyond our comprehension. That model was coherent. And for some reason, um, a lot of the biases that I would have had against a tradition a traditional Orthodox understanding of the Trinity and God uh, began to drift away. And the other book that my mom suddenly finds, I don't remember how she got it access to it, but it's this book right here, uh, Rod Dreyer, The Benedict Option. So I don't know how many Catholics are familiar with this. In, he's this an Eastern is a, Orthodox guy. Yeah, he, yeah he's, he's an Eastern Orthodox guy. He's, he, he, but the way he articulates his vision is based off of this one saint from the from the, from the beginning from the fall of the Roman Empire to the built about the Byzantine time. There's this guy named Saint Benedict, mm -hmm. and he's, he's a monk. And Rod Dreyer's job in this book was to articulate a vision of how to live the path of discipleship in a modern world that seemed to be falling apart around you. And at the beginning of this book, he articulates this. He, he's quoting this guy named Christian Smith that talks about this concept called moral therapeutic deism. And moral therapeutic deism, for those in the audience that don't understand what that is, is essentially this reduction of um, is this reduction of religion, of a monotheistic religion in which God is this person who created the world. He's not well involved in your life. Or to the extent to which he's involved in your life is primarily to make you feel happy. He's this therapeutic agent. And there is this idea that he wants everyone to be nice to each other. So you have moral therapeutic deism. And that provided a low resolution understanding to the things that I had begun to perceive in my most immediate interactions with people during this 2019, 2020, I was just shocked. I was like, who is this guy? And why does he have all these amazing ideas? And so there's this one page in the book. He says, we really need to reconnect with our Christian past. And so he starts quoting all these guys. He starts uh, mentioning all these guys by name, Ignatius of Antioch, Justin Martyr, Irenaeus, who's now my patron saint, by the way, um, Athanasius, uh, of course, St. Benedict right here. He just keeps listing on all these guys and calls them the church fathers. So here I am sitting here. And it's like, oh, hey, wait, am I recognize those guys from them somewhere? Hey, remember that guy that read books all the time that you didn't pay attention to five years ago? Why don't you got to talk to him? Josh Charles. Is this so, guy still around, Josh Charles? He's distant in, uh, he's a Facebook friend. Uh, Facebook acquaintance. I didn't really talk with him all that much. Although I had, uh, when I had, right around 2019, 2020, I started seeing more of his quotes for myself. He had become Catholic, um, confirmed, um, and, and uh, he was he was this very, uh, his very vigorous is uh, evangelist. And I saw these things, these 
again, it's just very similar style to what he was doing before, before he converted to Catholicism as a Protestant. He just quoted things and didn't leave any commentary. And I'm seeing this, and I make this connection between this one guy that these guys that Rod, Rod Dreyer is talking about. And then seeing Josh Charles over here, and this per, this uh, personal acquaintance of mine, this, hey, I wonder where I could get it, 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 the writings of these guys from. And so I send him a private message on Facebook. I don't ask for anything else. I just want to find out what these guys were up to. Because I'm more interested at that time in the um, how do you live out a devout Christian life um, that I was, wasn't getting the substance of in this environment. There's lots of complicated reasons for this. Um, when I was living, moving back and forth, I saw I, I saw a great diversity of people. And then during the pandemic, it just things started collapsing. It was uh, there's not a lack of virtuous Latter Day Saints, is what I'm trying to say. But there was enough people who had taken advantage of their faith in a way that was either moral therapeutic deism or political political polarization that frustrated me. And I wanted to avoid that. I wanted I want I want I wanted to do something that was a little more tailored to a a path of discipleship as a, as a per, cause that's in my mom having, she, uh, she was reading the book, this book at the same time I was. And we, uh, I started reading the church fathers and let me give you this idea. So, uh, Bruce R. McConkie, this guy that made all the note, the footnotes that you see in a King James version of Bible for Latter-day Saint. Uh, he had this very strong anti-Catholic, prejudice uh, he called essentially the 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 catholic church the great whore of babylon the great and abominable church is the phrase that's used in the book of mormon and i uh i see a read i read saint ignatius of antioch first and i see the phrase that he used to describe the church wherever jesus christ is there is the catholic church and so already and, and the, the thing that was so weird about that is because this guy didn't come across as someone that was actively trying to distort the faith or to slip by without being, without having his vices noticed. He didn't seem a guy that was flippant at all. I read his martyrdom account, which inspired, which inspired me more than I could comprehend at the time. I didn't know you could be devoted. You could be so devoted as to your faith as to recognize that a willing participation in suffering was the willingness to have Christ in you to help you participate in his act of love for the world. Um, I can I, understanding sacrifice in that way as he presented that colored my imagination so that I didn't that any sort of prejudice that I had accumulated um, being a Latter-day Saint suddenly evaporated with St. Ignatius of Antioch. And it wasn't an apologetic argument. It was a demonstration of virtue that I and that after reading Saint Ignatius, I saw consistently throughout the Church Fathers. I saw this unanimity among people that were widely dispersed. Um, Justin Martyr, he's trained as a philosopher, and in Ignatius, he lives in Antioch. It's like modern day Turkey, and then you got Irenaeus and Clement of Rome. There's this unity of voices that was uncharacteristic of the way I, I viewed the early, early church as a Mormon. And so there was no presence of this idea of a great apostasy. And the thing is, the strangest thing in the world, they were all, no one was showing any evidence that the church was about to collapse. But here's the thing they did say. Um, St. Ignatius of Antioch, he, uh, he writes this uh, a couple of paragraphs. I have it listed on my blog as well in the first article. He says, um, what danger do those people who try to distort false doctrine cause to themselves? They're like people that defile the, the family. Um, for, and, and for those who defile the flesh, how much more evil is the person who distorts the faith that Christ died for us. 
And then he says the strangest thing for this end, false doc, preservation from false doctrine. He says, the Lord did, did have ointment poured upon his head that he might breathe immortality into the Catholic Church. This was not the only guy that said things like this. And everybody that I was is talking to, uh, that I was reading, St. Ignatius, Clement of Rome, uh, Irenaeus, anybody that had a, did the chance to talk about authority was talking about it in terms of the bishops. There was no, the, the sense that Latter-day Saints have of hierarchy does not place bishops as the highest office or as an apostol, um, the apostolic office. The uh, apostle is supposed to be, be this distinct thing. And I did not see that at all in the church fathers. Um, what I saw, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, yeah. Um, I know we're running a little out of time here, but like, did your mom have the same experience or were you sharing some of these uh, findings with your mom? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I, my, I just said, well, well, let's look at all this stuff that I'm reading. And I said to her, well, well, she said to, well, sorry, she said to me, I'm having a, you know, well, let me read whatever you're reading so that we can talk about it together. It was a lot of the same thing she wanted to do with the Benedict option. It's just the idea of let's study this together and see what goes on. Um, there's a lot of stuff I wasn't able to get to about my journey, about um, why personal revelation, why that was is difficult for me to digest. There's a lot of background to that. But I get into the church fathers. I, I, I'm reading. Non, I, just, I just want to keep on reading. And all of a sudden, as a Latter-day Saint, this person that had become exposed to the church fathers, I'm wanting to talk about it all the time to my friends. Mm -hmm. And as strange as we possible. So uh, 2021, uh, I've read St. Ignatius of Antioch, Justin Martyr, Clement of Rome, Polycarp, all of these voices. And I go on this choir tour, um, Heritage Youth Chorus at American Heritage School, uh, run by choir director Rob Swenson. And I start, whenever I get into a deep conversation with somebody, I always mention, it's like, hey, want to read the church fathers? Is that kind of thing. I just wanted to talk about it all the time because I'm seeing this vigor and conviction that I felt starved by in the moment of isolation. I was saying, one of the things, I won't get into this too deeply, but um, having read the, starting, starting to read the Apostolic Fathers and all those people that immediately follow the apostles, um, I went back and looked at Latter-day Saint scholarship, like I was prone to do, look at things that advocate for your faith. And I was surprised by the um, how anti-Catholic those things were. Um, the, this the content of not being exposing yourself to anti-Mormon literature this a sense that people that are not interested in hearing the other your side, um, they don't want to take your faith seriously. They don't want to take all of that it, it together. These are people out to destroy your faith, essentially. That's your taught anti-Mormonism is. But the problem is, when I looked at the Latter Saint scholarship, all I could see was this character that I had come to associate with anti-Mormonism literature. And that disturbed me. I thought we were the good guys. It's that kind of thing. Yeah. And later on, this is kind of where we, I solidify more in my convictions. I'm starting. I'm, I'm starting to work through some things. Mormonism as a construct. I'll get into is very briefly the thing. I think we probably got you got ten more minutes, fifteen more minutes. It's now. Yeah. Okay, so Mormonism, I had been studying this. Um, one of the things, I would, again, I wanted a laser focus. I liked reading books all day. I was that guy now. And the thing that I was studying, there was this book that Joseph Smith had, um, Doctrine and Covenants. This is the first, this is a, I think it was an 1835 or 1837 edition. I can't quite remember. But in this book, there was a, passage in it called the lectures on faith um is this it made up about half of the book it's uh, if you're if everyone if, if you wonder what doctrine and covenants means doctrine used to mean the lectures on faith and covenants were all these other unique or peculiar revelations that joseph 
dictated to people at another time. So here's the thing. Lectures on faith used to be considered scripture. It underwent the, the official canonical procedure to be canonized as new scripture. And um, Jeremy Christiansen goes into us in this book. I quote some of that portion in my third article for the blog. But this, this passage of scripture has this very particular vision of the Godhead that is not at all like Latter-day Saints would characterize God nowadays. He's not anthropomorphic. He's not a man. There's no, there, there is a qualified distinction between who God is and who man is. It's more like a, a rudimentary Trinitarian model in the lectures on faith. It's not easy to square that with Latter-day Saint literature, and it particularly regards with the description of the Holy Spirit. So, the Holy Spirit in the lectures on faith is described as not a person. It's described instead as this um, combined mind or power or glory of the Father and the Son. That, that's transferred from the Father to the Son, goes down to the saints. Um, that is what is described in this passage. And in toward the end of Joseph Smith's life, if you go online and search up the textual development of this particular passage, Doctrine and Covenants, section 130, verse 22, um, by a guy named Ronald Bartholomew, this guy's Latter-day Saint, he de describes how the separate passage of scripture that was later than the lectures on faith, Joseph Smith went from saying that the Holy Ghost was not a person with this combined will to all of a sudden saying that the Holy Spirit is a person who is like us, who has a, who's like, he's this human soul who's awaiting to receive a body. It's getting it. She's trying to consolidate things into this new anthropomorphic perspective. But what happens later on, Doctrine and Covenants, section 130, verse 22, that passage before it got into scripture was reversed. The meaning of it was reversed. So no longer was it saying that the Holy Ghost is a person made out of, um, Latter-day Saints don't think um, spirit is immaterial. They think it's matter. Mm -hmm. That's no longer metaphysical discussion. But they say the Holy Spirit can't dwell in us, therefore spirits, his spirit cannot dwell inside the human soul. But Brigham Young, around uh, years later, after Joseph Smith was gone, altered that phrase from a sermon that Joseph gave to fit the lectures on faith. Yeah. So I think that's just like the changing of the church right there, the changing of the teachings. It's, it's a, it's a radical cheat. It's a radical change in a core teaching of the church, the nature of who God is. Yeah. Because, and, um, of course, compared and, like to that enduring revelation of the church fathers, uh, not revelation, but enduring tradition, right. apostolic. Uh, I mean, I, I, I do use the word enduring revelation because, and and, and, I, and I explain this a little more on my blog. The thing that was is so perplexing to me at the time when I read the church fathers was that no one was presuming that the faith could be destroyed. And so I'm seeing this radical shift in the way that revelation is understood. There's not this sense that the faith can be changed at mm -hmm. will by the authorities. There's this much greater sense of accountability in the church fathers than I ever got in Mormonism. And that yeah. stunned me. And so when I saw what Catholic teaching was described as such, they described it as immortal. This the, the, the idea that the church is immortal for the preservation of doctrine and this idea that you're supposed to be able to transfer over everything that you've been presented from the past, either in, in scripture or in oral tradition, which was later written down. Um, that shocked me to death because it was so different uh, in Latter-day Saints. The 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 platitude you're used to hearing is continuing revelation, um, which has this more of a recency bias flair to it. Um, 
I was not used. Uh, so, so the this whole idea that something was not just meant to be present, but it was also meant to be present and stick. This thing that you could depend on. It was so I think that's really um, what stands out about the Catholic Church nowadays. You have so much uh, change in the world, or so much fleeting institutions. So many of uh, the institutions like crumbling all around us. Even Catholic Christian Church. institutions, right? Yeah, the, um, all the denominations even are changing, like their own teachings and all of that. And so, when you, when you are a person stuck in this whirlwind, then you see the light of the Catholic Church. So I think that's really helpful. Uh, just like lastly, my last question here would be: mm -hmm. Do you have any advice for just a indifferent, uh, worldly person today? Say. A young person, since we're both young people, we can uh, speak to them, I think, uh, mm -hmm. more strongly. But say like a teenager like yourself. What, I'm 20 uh, years old. Yeah. So uh, yeah. when you were a teenager, kind yeah. of like, uh, going through this entire phase, and I kind of went through that same um, transitional period. But do you have any advice for a person um, that is looking for like uh, truth, just looking for truth? I don't think that you can get by with treating religion as moralism. And this idea that you can that just, you can just be reduced to a set of rules, and that that's how you're that's not what captivates people. I think um, what captivates people is this opportunity to participate in a story, and to know that that's living, and also that that's something that connects you with the way not only the it's not only the present, it's not only the modern world, but it's also the thing that has come before. I think if people desire more accountability. There's some, I, th I think, I, th I think this idea of building up your own private concept of meaning is taxing on people, and people are distressed because they're isolated, but not because, not not be, not be, not not because of the. Not 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 because there's no not, not because there's no such thing as true meaning, but the, the, there is this uh, there's this there's a, there's this mystery to be found in the things that we've not been exposed to to our ancestors, and so I'll briefly describe what happened. So I uh, all of a sudden now that I've read some of the church fathers, I get in touch with Joshua Charles. We explore more of our journey, and um, you know the whole situation about what my dad eventually thought about my conversion and then later on with my mom's conversion and we we're you know we we're really doing this about the same time um we're exposed more and more we start going to we start we'd have our first mass right around easter we'd go to the Maudie thursday mass and i walked through the doors this is this this wouldn't be exactly a traditional parish but it was it was a living parish it was a it was traditional enough that i got a sense for the sanctity of that which is ancient. Because the Maudie Thursday is the day that the Lord's Supper happened before Easter and Good Friday. And you saw people having their feet washed. And seeing this in person, seeing this conviction played out and also still laid out with substance by the church fathers in this continuity of teaching. I found that so riveting and um, there's, there, there's a lot more to talk about in regards to how I thought about my, my, my myself. I stopped. Th I, I, I think later on uh, this idea that you could exalt yourself into a God that was later replaced with this notion that you weren't meant to be independent. You weren't meant to have a divinity for yourself. You were meant to partake of divine, the, the divine nature, as St. Peter said in Scripture. And the way that that reveals itself through the Mass and through the working of the Holy Spirit in the Church across centuries, that's supposed to be tangible. And I think, Inc., there is great value in the expression of your faith in a tangible form nowadays. 
And if you're if you're living faith, unsure of whether you if if you're living with this sense of either indifferent antism to faith or not having a place that you feel like you can have people that sh are surrounded by a sense of meaning that was objective, something that was not at the whim of whatever modern teaching was present, either among your leaders, um, whether that's Protestantism or Mormonism. I think both a lot, a lot of those have the same problems because um, Calvin and Luther said very similar things to Joseph Smith. I think the idea uh, that there's this uh, objective reality that we could be hold ourselves accountable to, and that could give us that was something that was like manna from heaven. It's something. It's a the uh, continuity is a grace. Um, community rooted in that is a grace. And no matter what happens, no matter how dark, no matter how indifferent other people may feel, if there's at all this inkling in your life to pursue a deeper path, to pursue greater meaning, there is a door open to that. There's a door that it it you can be optimistic about, and I and that is is Catholicism. I, I'll be proud of that. Yeah, so I think that's a good point to end on just the word Catholicism. But thank you for really sharing your own story. Um, I do relate to it in some sense, like uh, just going through the same uh, phase of reading um, just those books like uh, the Benedict Option or Jordan Peterson. I kind of listen to people like that. I probably listened to a talk by this Rod guy. Um, yeah, I think like our experiences are very common nowadays. There's lots of people mm -hmm. really looking for something lasting. And so hopefully this uh, talk, this podcast. Enduring Revelation. More. That in Reve yeah. Revelation in the sense that God wants to live, to be th thoroughly involved in your life, not just now, but in the past and in the future, because that's supposed to be his sign of his faithfulness to you. Yeah. And so where can um, viewers find your blog? You mentioned a blog at the very beginning of this. Right. So, OK, I'll mention a couple of things. So one, you can look at my blog, windsofeden.wordpress.com. You can also follow me on Twitter. My Twitter handle is at Jared Selim. Um, Facebook is where I post most of my apologetics posts. Um, I'm also on Instagram, oh, no, not as much there, but I think that's a, I think that's a good summary if you want to have a further investigation into my journey. So yeah. there's a lot to, there's a lot, there's a lot uh, to talk about that I couldn't get to, but we're, we'll be, we'll be either happy to talk again soon or be other times to explain that it's been a pleasure being on the podcast with you, Michael, and thank yeah. you for yeah. taking the time to listen. For sure. Thank you. And God bless everyone who's still watching. Uh, have a good week. Have a good Saturday. Saturday's still young. So take care, everyone. God bless. Not of the modern world. For, For the, the modern, modern, modern world. world. That's, That's right. Yeah, and, and... Fisher Baron. Hello. It's from the airport. Oh, yeah. How you Hello. We're doing nice good. To nice yeah. to meet you. So who are you, sir? I'm Archbishop Joseph Nauman of the Archdiocese of Kansas City in Kansas. Yeah, do you want to bless this recorder? Is that is there a blessing for that? There's a blessing for everything. So, yeah, Lord, we ask you to bless this instrument and use it for good and for a